basically an overview of the concept plan that I think everybody has had some input in or at least uh, some knowledge of. Um, what we're really proposing is four stages to this plan. First stage is establishing a nearshore reef um, that will provide wave attenuation, uh, disrupt the wave energy, and help stabilize any beach that's then put on the secondary. Uh, the beach fill, there's been, um, I didn't pass it around, but I'm sure everybody has already seen it. There was a concept plan that was designed um, with Dr. Farrell providing some of the some of the specifications for the slope and the, and the height and width, and then there was this landscape design that I think everybody has seen at some point, hopefully. Um, so this would be the beach bill that we would be applying to both the Fork River Beach and the Beach Club Beach. Um, the idea is to cover the Gavion with the dune where it's currently located and then just providing another storm protection value to those areas where there is no gap yet. Um, whether or not you actually decide to go through with all the vegetation options that are presented here, that's up to the group, I guess, collectively to determine whether or not you really want a marsh edge restoration or if you want a sandy beach or a combination thereof, possibly in different locations. Um, that can all be determined later on. The basic concept, the basic uh, slope design, template design is still the same as what was presented there. Um, in that sheet, there's some facts and uh, estimates for the cost of the sand. That's on the. Uh, I'm trying to see which actually piece that pertains to. Yeah, it's in two. Um, if you look at it, we broke it down so we show what the what the uh, area for the. I guess you're calling it the the public beach versus the private beach. Uh, we call it the FRB for Fort River Beach and BCB for the uh, Beach Club Beach. Um, so the uh, linear footage for the Fort River Beach or Public Beach is about 1,600 feet of, of area that we're going to be covering. Uh, about 1,170 feet of that is Bayfront Beach. 370 feet is the wraparound of the point. And then there's about 120 feet that would be a taper into the existing conditions near the terminal end of the, of the uh, western end of the, of the Gavions. So for that, um, we looked at, and based on rough estimates, this is not, these numbers should not be taken as gospel. There is going to be a need for a complete detailed survey of the beach and in the near shore to really determine the actual volume that's going to be needed. But a rough estimate based on some rough calculations that were done in the field by Dr. Farrell, uh, the estimate we're looking at is about 18,000 cubic yards for that section. Um, the reason it's a little bit more than originally, I think Pat had had uh, shown, is because we're now wrapping around the, the point. We're not stopping where the initial concept is planned. At. The reason for that is we didn't want to have any end effect erosion at the end of that, that design. Uh, so we felt that we needed to have a taper that brought into the end of the project area. Uh, so when you look at that, Pat had some good estimates. I believe around $15 a, uh, a ton was the estimate she was getting from some of the sand supplies from quarries. So that's about 20, the, the 18,000 cubic yards is about 27,000 tons. So we're roughly looking at about $405,000 for that section delivered. That is not spread. Okay. Well, what was the cost per cubic yard? 15 cubic yards. $15. Which isn't bad, but they, yeah, have, a local, good, they yeah. have a local source here, so it's not too bad. Um, spreading cost, I would recommend considering using municipal and, and uh, county resources that may be available to you. Two reasons for that is it can reduce your cost, you don't have to bring a contractor in. Second is you can use those resources as matches for any grant funding go out and try to apply for it. Uh, match will be very important when you go to apply for grants. So if you can get the cooperation from the municipality to bring over bulldozers, front end loaders, anything of that nature, to help you with spreading the material, it can reduce your cost considerably and be a benefit to any grant you apply for. Um, so when we looked at the, so that's, that's basically the plan for the, for the public beach, for the private beach. We Reduce the size of that beach a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about why in a little bit, but we're looking at 
about 550 to 750 feet of linear footage for the private beach that we would cover. We would have a full template, same using the same template, all the way down to the rubble mound. Um, I think you guys are familiar, not the terminal groin, but it's like a yep, smaller yep. rubble yeah, mound. Yeah, out, yeah. Outlets right. Where the, the sewer is. Right, and then from that point, we would taper the beach back in about 270 feet into that. I'm calling it the cove because it's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a cove feature there between that rubble mound and then the terminal point. The reason for that, rather than bringing the beach all the way down to the terminal groin, is to allow for a pocket beach where sand can accumulate naturally. The uh, longshore drift appears to be in that south southerly direction, so we're anticipating any losses will accumulate behind that groin. Two good things about that is it provides you with options for long-term maintenance. As sand accumulates there, you can then come back out, harvest that sand as it accumulates, and then transport it back to where your erosional beaches are. It's a backpack program. Been very successful in a lot of places on the ocean front. Also been successful in some smaller bay areas. Um, one of the things that we would have to do, though, in order to do that is we would have to rehabilitate that core. Right now, it's, it's very sand pervious. You can see the sand gets through it. It then gets into the creek and then winds up back in the lagoons. So as part of that project, the last part of it is, is to really do a rehabilitation of that, of that koi. Um, that's probably where we have the, the most question mark in our estimates for, for cost. The reason for that is, is you really have to have a little bit more of an engineering study to look at the wave and current dynamics <coughs> that the koi is going to have to extend. So the size of the rock that would be required. Right now, it looks like it's just kind of a hodgepodge of riprap that was thrown out there. Um, what we would suggest doing, not as an engineer design, but as a, just a suggestion from our standpoint as close to process people, we would like to see some sort of a core placed onto that groin that would make it uh, sand retention increased. Um, it would, usually we would use sheet goods as a possibility, uh, whether it's timber or vinyl, those are options. You could also use a rock crib if you wanted to. There's several different options that you could do. That would be some place where an engineer would probably be better suited to make that recommendation based on the climate, wave climate and all that. Um, but whatever the case is, we need to make sure that we're trapping the sand on the updrift side of that structure rather than allowing it to seep its way into the, into the creek and then into the little guns. Two reasons for that is obviously we don't want to, you know, clog up the, the access for, for boaters and, and people using that facilities back in the Goons. And then the other is so that we can retain the sand and then re-harvest it and reuse it again, rather than having to come back in at a later date after all the sand's washed out and you know bringing more sand in. So in a nutshell, that's pretty much the concept of what we planned. This has some more detailed uh, information in it, you know, the footage and the and the cost um, for the for the south end part of the beach, in front of the beach club, we're looking probably at around. 10,500 cubic yards, roughly depending on the exact taper of the of the of the, of the end of the cove there. How many feet it depends on if there's a. I know sometimes people will say we're well, not putting sand in front of my house, so you know there may be pushback from that. There would be um, any pushback on the southern end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that understanding that um, we would try. Would, would, would not be any pushback. There would not be any pushback. There would not be any pushback for, okay. for the for the private beach. Okay, great, great. So then if we're, if we're looking at that, then we're looking at about 10,500 cubic yards and probably around 236,000 you know, based on the numbers that, that pack up for that. So we're looking at a little over 600,000 yards total for sand. That's delivered. So that's probably the most expensive part of the project over there is getting that sand. Um, the cost for the, for, the, uh, for the groin rehab, we, we, we did a ballpark cost. And I, I'm not putting a lot of value into this cost rate at the moment. But we're looking probably around five hundred thousand dollars for that. I know somebody had a seventy-five thousand. Yeah, I uh, contacted Albert Marine, who's done the great water design at Berkeley. They've done a lot of work along the bay. Okay. And uh, he estimated, based on the parameters I gave him, one hundred thirty-six feet out by well, uh, by 20, a twenty-five foot base, a five foot top, and five feet deep. Five hundred seventy-five tons of rock. He knows that the boulders need to be at least two and a half feet, two tons, yeah. right? And uh, at least two, you know, one and a half tons, whatever, you know. And uh, that's what he came back with. I mean, seventy-five thousand, seventy-five thousand materials bucks, and everything. And labor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good price. price. <laughs> that's that's, that's, a, that's a, a budgetary number. So I'm assuming that 
It's on the high end of what he would charge. Usually budget theory is a little bit higher than normal. And that included some kind of a core, like a sheet, like a sheet pile? That's going no, to the core. All rubble. All rubble. All rubble. Okay. Um, that's something I would, I would suggest that we have an engineer take a look at first before we just go ahead with that, because if we just do all rubble, um, it may not do what we want it to do as far as retaining the sand. It, that becomes very, it's very difficult to use just large capstones and, and make it sand impervious. Mm -hmm. Well, but if you put like a liner within, within the parameter of the, uh, of the rubble wall. I'm sorry, what's a that? A liner. A liner? Yeah. Geofabrics are great when they're not exposed con con constantly to the environment. Yeah. The longer yeah. they're exposed, the faster they break down, and then they lose that mm -hmm. they lose that that that, uh, that protection that you would get from. I really don't recommend using geofabrics as a, as an alone source for, for for what we're looking for it to do. Mm -hmm. um, you could crib it with smaller structure in the middle, and then put smaller compact wrap rip wrap, and then mm -hmm. cap that with stone. Mm -hmm probably wouldn't add that much more cost to what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But it does require you to then excavate the, what's there and then install the core and then cover it back up. So there might be an additional cost. Yeah, but yeah. it sounds like if you're getting those kinds of numbers from them that we may be able to come in at a lot less than, than I don't know, what, how did you guys come up with a $500,000 estimate? It's based, it's based solely on past projects that we've been involved with. Um, so it's, it's based on what is going on in adjacent communities, mm -hmm. not adjacent to here, but in the New Jersey community, oceanfront, and also on the dead sides. So, it, it's, it's it, like I said, it's a rough estimate. We did yeah. not do any engineering design or any of that nature. We didn't go out and spec it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, because I, I don't like to, we, we are not engineers. Yeah. We have an engineer on staff, but he's not a, he's not a licensed engineer. Yeah. So we have consultants that we work with who are licensed engineers that we would contact for the design work. Uh, Rich Wagle would probably be the person that I would go to for this. He's a professor emeritus up at Drexel University, very well respected in the field of coastal processes. He would be the person I would recommend because he knows groins. He's built a lot of them all over the place. Um, but it's not to say you have to go with him. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, how much of an impact uh, would when we find out what actually is there would that have on the on the like? Like, we don't know what's there. Right. We don't know whether it was rock that was thrown there, how it was set right. up, how it was built. That would have an impact also, I would assume, on... Absolutely, and that would be that would be the prerequisite, if you will, to doing a design, is to do a condition survey of the existing mm -hmm. okay. engine and the region surrounding it, get a real detailed information on what's there now. Um, that would then go into the design of the actual structure. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's definitely... The first two things that I would suggest as you move forward that you do in order to get real good handle on these numbers is to do the detailed topographic and bathymetric survey and the detailed survey of the joint for existing conditions that are around it. Um, we have to do that. You can have licensed surveyors or anybody that does survey quality work. Mm -hmm. Coastal Center obviously is capable of doing it, but I'm not trying to advocate for us necessarily. But um, you, know, you do need to have somebody that has been involved in this kind of work and knows what they're looking for. Um, not sure, Stan, do you guys do survey work? No. Um, there, are, there are other groups that do it, so I mean, there's, there's options for you guys to go out and, and, and check out. This know. may be a very simple question, but is the way you build the groin affected by the prevailing winds on the beach, yes. the water currents? Absolutely, on? absolutely. A wave and current study is included in my recommendation for this area. Um, it can do, we can do wave uh, pine casting, which is basically looking at forecasting and then doing theoretical calculations for it. We can also install gauges out there, uh, aquadops that do profiling the currents and waves. Or we could just do a simple LEO program. Um, there's a lot of you living here. Somebody can go out every day, you, know, you can take turns, and go out and collect visual observations. You know, there's a program that we established. We did it with uh, um, U.S. vets down on Delaware Bay, they, they were very effective at doing We did a small short training program, and it's, it's a pretty s straightforward process. It doesn't take a lot of training to get yourself up and ready to do it. We, we think there might be a nearby data set. John Miller did some wave survey, what wave field work for the Berkeley County Park Project. So okay, that would help. Yeah, that's just up the street of it. Uh, yeah. It may not be identical, but it should be similar. 
That would definitely provide a background and a baseline to look at. I still, especially with the groin, I would want to see what's going on with the Tidal Creek right yeah. here. There's going to be some local you know, interaction with that Tidal Creek that, that may be different than what John had. But that would certainly help us with knowing what to expect as far as what's going to be impacting the shoreline. We may not have to do as much up, up on the beach and see what kind of waves and currents are affecting that. So the question, what effect will nuclear, the nuclear power plant closing potentially have on what you're proposing? Any, anything at all? Or? I'm not 100% familiar with what they're proposing to do as part of that, but as long as they're not changing the dynamics of the creek. But, but, no, they're, they're closing the plant. It's going the, down. The, the, it, it flows opposite. opposite. It, 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 it flows unnaturally because of the nuclear power. Oh, right now it flows unnaturally? Yeah. Okay. So that may reverse your some of your local tidal currents then, so that would be that could have an impact on, on the... But that's supposed to shut in October. Okay. Well, my understanding is shut, they're turning off the electricity generation, but they're still going to run the plant. They're going to run the It's like at 5 to 10 percent, something like that. And so... so there will be a change. There will be somewhat of a change. It, it, it will be a little different, and to Steve's point, uh, that there may be a change to what you see, especially on extreme tidal events or extreme storm events. Right. So, so there, could, there could definitely be an influence there. Um, There's a kind of a prevailing thought in the community because it's a river currently that runs in reverse. Mm -hmm. Now that groin, from what I looked at, that doesn't go into the river though. That's right on it's the outside. Right at the edge. Yeah, it's a right tidal gate that goes in the lagoons, right? Mm -hmm. So for designing the actual structure, probably not as much influence there, mm -hmm. but it may play an influence on, on what's going on in the front beach and how, how the materials being swept along that beach. I don't think it's going to be, I still think your prevailing drift is going to be to the south because your fetch is from the, uh, from the northeast. But Keep in mind, 10% is still going to be 160 million gallons a day getting pumped down. Flushing through that. So. Could it ever go That's back? That's three I mean, times the sewage discharge, discharge short, right. So right. There's a, a thought in the community that it might just all go back to the way it was once the plant stops or stops substantially. I mean, is that, uh, my understanding is it's the fetch, yes. which is our primary problem. Right, here. right, and and you're right. I mean, I'm sure Stan knows this. Any place along the bay, you're seeing similar kinds of impacts on this side of the, on this side of the bay. And it, it comes from that northeast fetch, the storm fetch, and, the, and also boat wakes. I mean, boat wakes are, play a large role in what happens on these, on these banks. So I don't know exactly what kind of boating traffic you have out here, but you know, it definitely plays a role. You're seeing that in a lot of the local marsh areas. Hot boat traffic. Yeah, so I mean that's, and, and keep in mind that all these projects that we're talking about, none of these is going to really save us from Sandy. Yeah. Okay. Sandy's going to, the, the surge from Sandy is going to inundate anything that's built here. It's going to inundate all the property. You know, you, short of building a, maybe a 16 foot wall out the seawall that dikes the whole community, you're not going to stop the flooding, you're not going to stop the storm surge. Um, you can say that storm. Storm. Is that something that could happen every year? Well, decade. okay, so at one time it definitely was a 100 year story, yeah, but yeah. as we move yeah. forward, yeah. Yeah. Um, now it may happen every five storms, years. That's right, the frequency of storms is, is, is occurring much greater. I mean, I remember when I started this back in 1987, uh, um, if we had one major storm every couple of years that was considered, and I'm not talking a, I'm not talking a 100 year storm, I'm talking like a 40 year storm, a real 10 year storms. They really occurred like every 10, 5, 10 years, you know, that's when you have a big storm. A moderate type storm, a, a Jonas type storm, like, like that kind of event. Now, since 2009 particularly, we've had multiple storms like that every year. And it's making much more of a challenge. And of course we have sea level rise and everything else that's, that's contributing. So, um, I mean, the perfect you know, storm, I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody in here is a non-believer in, in wave climate or, or you know, weather changes and, and all that, but sea level rise is real. Um, I'm not going to get into the, whether or not we believe in you know, climate change and all that, but sea level, run, sea level rise is real, it's, it's measurable, it's occurring, um, and the store frequency is increasing for us here on the East Coast. So those are, those are two facts that we're going to live with. Um, so to answer your question, will this go back just from the power plant closing? I, I don't think that would be possible. I spoke to Professor Mike Kensh and Rutgers, and he told me since 95, Bay has risen. It was either four inches or six inches. And he said, bear in mind, that's not vertical. It's out and over, too. Both, right. right. 
So yes, you know we're we're facing that. So there's there's a real need here if we're going to maintain property, you know, as a as a fixed location that we have, we have to respond to what's going on the, on the uh, shoreline to try and stabilize it. And the best alternative that we have right now that's both ecological and cost efficient is to do what we're proposing here with reefs, whether they're the shell bag reef that we're going to talk a little bit about shortly, or whether it's a an oyster castle or reef balls or whatever it is that you want to put out there, um, you're going to need some kind of a feature that will attenuate waves and dampen the wave energy as it impacts the shoreline in order to keep that shoreline stable. Stable being a relative word. Um, you still will suffer storm damage on the larger storms. Uh, what you will see is a reduction in the in-between losses. Of, you know, you'll see more stability and more manageability to your losses. So. I guess that kind of wraps up that aspect of what I was going to talk about. Um, we'll move on now, I guess, to talking more in specifics, unless somebody has any questions that they'd like to talk about with the beach design and, and the groin. Is there a, a question about the uh, oyster bags? I know Al, you're talking about them, but maybe more on the science side of that. Uh, I'm not that familiar with you and uh, Dr. Farrell as far as what you do down in Stockton. I am more familiar okay. with uh, Davidson Laboratory up in Stevens. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess that you guys are similar in what you guys do in your analyses? So Stockton University, the Coastal Research Center, has been there since 1986, 30 years worth of coastal zone process management uh, applications. We are the state's leading go-to consultant on coastal zone processes and, and concerns. Uh, we, do a, we do the monitoring and uh, post-storm damage assessments for the state and also the federal governments and a lot of municipalities. So Dr. Farrell um, <coughs> and myself, actually, we've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, Stevens Institute Technology really focuses more on engineering designs. Um, they also are consultants with the state they handle more of the engineering, we handle more of the coastal processes. So that's how it's kind of split up in the state. Okay. So as my, my question is really stemmed from the type of breakwater that's, that's mm -hmm. used. I know they have their big wave study machine and all that other stuff. So is with these oyster bags or any type of breakwater that you guys have seen and used, have that, has that been modeled with, with this type of uh, wave energy and all that other stuff okay. as well? It was not put in, into um, wave tanks, no. Um, but we've done real live monitoring mm -hmm. of, the, of the units as they've been placed out. So um, our team assembled after Sandy down on, on Delaware Bay uh, with the society taking the lead on that. We did habitat restoration projects down there, both the ones, what do we have, six or seven habitat restoration projects that we've done in that time frame? We've different done, different <coughs> sites. We've done eight beaches. Eight beaches, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So those were primarily done as a uh, habitat for breeding horseshoe crabs and for foraging shorebirds. Mm -hmm. um, but we recognized real early on that we had to do something to try and stabilize those, those sandy beaches because they're very narrow, very thin strips of sand down there. Um, and we started installing, we came up with a design and a concept for, for uh, using the shell bag. And we started installing the first one we installed in 2015 at Reeds Beach. Um, We've done monitoring on it since it was installed three years now. We have monitoring, and actually, that's if you look at the end of the of the uh, yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw that. Yeah. 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 So you'll see that that is that is uh, taken from the Reed's Beach application. Uh, you can see how they have performed both in. Well, it doesn't really. The, the, if I get this up and running, it'll show better how it stabilized the beach. But that does show you how the units have been resilient over the years. Now. Green Speech, if you're not familiar with it, is, is subject to significant waves. Mm -hmm. It's a fetch that's the whole length of Delaware Bay. Mm -hmm. um, it's also s subject to significant ice flow and accumulation. And these bags have remained really very stable, considering I was I was skeptical. I got to tell you, when we first started doing this, I thought yeah, the ice was. Steve. I know. I thought I really I was skeptical. I thought I was not so skeptical about it, about it working as far as attenuating wave energy. But I was skeptical that it would hold up to the ice, and they have. They have. They've been. They've been incredibly resilient. So, and, and here's the reason why I'm asking you these questions, Steve, mm -hmm. is that you know I read the doc, the the uh, design manual that mm -hmm. Stephen puts out, right, and they talk about you know based on wave height and and fetch, 
that you need a rock that a boulder that's at least two and a half to three and a half feet in diameter and between a ton and a ton and a half per boulder right I'm looking at a big boulder like this, and they saw in the picture of your oyster bags. I'm sure they all weigh a ton and a half. No, yeah, right. So, so, so that's why I'm, I'm skeptical. How could a, I see a boulder working because it's heavier and it's more, you know, substantive versus a bag of shells? So what has quickly, and Al can talk more of this if you'd like to, but um, what has quickly happened when we've installed these? First of all, they're they're rebarred down and they're tied in place right. in a short run. So we make, it, we make it into. A, each one is, comes its own sing, it's a singular mass. So it's not just one bag out there. Yeah. Um, and then what quickly happens is we have bio um, accumulation real quick on, on these shells, and it becomes almost a cemented single mass uh, through that bio accumulation. Mm -hmm. So you can see it in some of the, I think, I don't know if those pictures on the back are close enough to really see how they accumulate. But again, if I get them. How far out were they placed? So it varies, um, but um, so the one we did last was about 50 feet from mean low water. Roughly. Yeah, I got the same number. Yeah. Still. And then I think it went out another 50 feet, so we had two. So we do a herringbone kind of a double row for down there, and that's kind of the signature that we've used in, in Delaware Bay. Um, we have extended some of the segment sizes just to kind of play around with that and, and see what we can do. Um, one thing Steve didn't mention is the, the beauty of those little intertidal reefs is, is, is if there is damage to them, people come back out and fix it or repair it. Unless, unless they're totally fused, then it's different. So we've seen uh, I'm sorry. at Reed's Beach, number one, I'll show you some pictures when it comes up, but that each segment is totally fused now by oysters. And it took about three years. We had national recruitment, um, and we monitored all that. We actually now have to change how we monitor the reefs because we can't do the transects like we used to do. We remove bags, we just can't. So now we're, we do uh, like a bike tire, make a transit lay, lay it over that way, and kind of count and see what's going on. But we've had, I think the first time we had two sets. We're getting like multiple sets a year. And it varies. It, it'll vary in Delaware Bay depending on the current too. Right. And Dr. Farrell said that's 25 miles across at that point where we were at that beach, that yeah, jewelry. Oh, at Delaware Bay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, he said it was like it was like four to five times our wave energy here. Right. Yeah, they get some good waves there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. They've been doing a wave attenuation study there as well um, with uh, Dr. Niles and Dr. Smith, and they put out just to see how the reef is working. And um, I believe reeds, moderate tides, moderate conditions, it attenuates about 35% of the wave energy. So roughly in that way. I mean, it's like Steve said, you're not going to get rid of all of it. Mm -hmm. But I feel that the double row actually it dissipates, hits it again, dissipates, and and then some. And you'll see the pictures. Then some of the sediment in the sand starts falling out, and we're actually building beach back um, at Moore's Beach, which is I, I, we weren't there yet. But Moore's Beach now the reef height is maybe this big, and that was two feet because the sand's coming up. And then we can compare it to the control beach right next to it, and it's scoured out. So the sand's filling right next to it. Yeah. So the, the idea is eventually either you can move the reef out because you're creating a bigger beach um, and you have a new intertidal habitat there, or you can build on top if you want to make it. I don't know, but I'm thinking building out might be the next step for us. Those those bags, do they, they, do they become effective day one, or do they need time to? Uh, well, they're going to settle. Stuff, they're going to yeah. settle, of course. You know, so. Um, I, I'd say they become effective pretty much day one. Yeah, as far as wave attenuation, yeah. they're effective immediately. I mean, if you, you were down there, right? <coughs> yeah. We've been at Dyer's. We just saw once, like, once a month. Was in the so it was like, you can see as you're placing them down, you know, just looking <coughs> long shore, you can see, you see the wave energy coming in. As soon as you put the bags down, what's coming behind it is just spraying water, breaking the shallow water. They, they so settle like bean bags almost. They almost take their own forms and sort of interlock like bean bags. Their problem was the. And of course, you really, from what up. Steve told me, it's not like you're just out there piling up bags. Mm -hmm. You've really worked at. Well, you had those. It's big all staked and flat. the ground already mm -hmm. before we started, right? So, uh -huh. right. Okay. So, so we do kind of it first. So Steve will come out and after because we mm -hmm. make the plan basically, um, the engineering plan on how to configure the reef based on sesh. Um, <laughs> we talk about Leo observations, these kind of things. And we've also, through uh, our Delaware Bay sediment transport analysis tool now, we can look at grain size of sand, what's going to stay on, where's your tipping point, kind of a piece of that puzzle. So uh, once he comes in, he stakes them out, and we just 
I believe in restoration through volunteerism anyway. And it really cuts costs or, or cost sharing. And I don't have a lot of my other projects here that I do, but um, county, municipality, partner together and have a cost share right there um, on a lot of these. And I saved uh, sort of like, for instance, the Bradley Beach Maritime Forest. That was about a, um, a $250,000 project probably, 170 to 250. We did it for 40 grand cash. But it's, it's the power of the team that you bring together, that partnership, you know. Do you know, I mean, I'm not asking for the plan, but do you have any idea how far out they would need to be on this particular stretch of beach? I would leave that up to Steve from his model. I couldn't just tell you without, you know, one thing I, I like to do too is, you know, we're not just going out there willy-nilly and placing bags out there. There's a whole modeling piece ahead of that. So we do listen to the baseline. We have these turtles that come in here. The the yeah, how is that going to affect that? We're well, going to have gaps. So oh, okay. same, same with the horseshoe crab. We were more concerned with the horseshoe crab getting back out. Yeah. Ah, um, okay. I mean, I don't think you're going to have a problem with terrapins if you have a good gap. They come in, they're going to sure. come right out. You know, and that's we basically in our region set up treatments, uh, aquatic fencing, uh -huh. to see which crabs are coming in where, and if they're the same crabs getting out, and uh, there was no problem. We looked at height, and there was no problem because eventually the tide comes up above. If you, look, if you look at the layout that we have here, you can see that there, this is, we're not proposing one continuous long reef. That right. here. These are all set segments. They'll be oriented in such a way that each segment will, will uh, shelter from the wave orientation that's, that, that's propagated through the area. And then there's an offset, and then there'll be another set of reefs that go down from there. So in between each, there'll be a gap. And then also within the reefs that we use segments, we don't create a continuous rate. The, the, because we use two rows, we can offset them so that it, it is a continuous structure, but each one is segmented into different pieces, unlike the castles or the reef balls where it's a continuous feature that usually that they, that they string along. So this allows for a lot more uh, access for crabs and other things. I mean, we're starved for sediment this system. Absolutely. So I think it's in the Delaware Bay. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a common problem. Actually, yeah. It's up in the Atlantic Coast because we're dumping sand over there, but in the sections of the Atlantic Coast are sand sort. Well, it's, it's just, this, this is a really narrow beach mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the ones that... So when I said that we've been placed them at mean low water, it, it, it doesn't have to be placed at mean low water. That was based on, again, the design. There's a whole criteria, there's a whole... There's a whole we can make the structure a little bit higher and place it in the deeper water and still have the same impacts um, and the same benefits. So but that's going to be dependent on permitting again and nav navigable waters. So it's it also could be limited to six inches too. It's right. also dependent on what kind of conditions we see when we do the survey. I mean, you're asking me to give you a, 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 sh a definite thing. I don't know if there's a flat, shallow platform out here that we can work on or if it drops off. It's yeah. a nice hard substrate. Yeah. So if it's a nice hard substrate that's a shallow platform. Even though the beach width may be expanded outwards, we still may be able to move the reefs out accordingly so that we maintain that distance from the shoreline that you want and still be able to place them into a zone that is effective at attenuating waves as they approach. Well, let me run through this just to show you how we've done some of our projects in Delaware Bay and how it might parallel to something up here. The yeah, natural set there was, was for Barnett Bay, not Delaware Bay, because we didn't, we didn't spat the ones we didn't, we didn't do any spat in Delaware Bay. That's right, it's all natural. So I'm capping out. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Habitat Restoration Program Director in the American Loop Society. I'm also a certified coast ecologist and uh, recently got my master's degree about last year. So I've been doing this for about 20 some years now and just kind of grew into it, came from the private industry and decided to go nonprofit where I could really do the kind of work that I thought was important. Let's just see if we can get this one going right. So one thing today kind of gives me a, a heads up too is it's partners and, and, and the team and working together and seeing all you guys, different people here that are concerned. This is what really starts building that partnership to get a project in the ground. Um, for just our Delaware Bay, this, this is uh, roughly $5 million in grant funding that we received, maybe a little bit more, uh, right after Sandy in 2015. We have three core partners, uh, Concerned Wildlife, Stop University, and Larry Niles and uh, his staff. But we had funding we kind of meshed together from a variety of sources. And to do these projects, sometimes you do have to mosaic funding sources together. And what we're talking about matching things to get different pieces of it that are non-federal. But here's what we've done so far. And here's just a, a typical segment of what one of these would, would look like, our reef. But 
We've done 2.75 miles of beach, roughly, restored almost 200,000 uh, 200, cubic yards of sand, removed rubble, so like you're talking about the pool and things like that. We've done all that kind of work. And we built, it says four here, but we built five intertidal reefs now. We just built our last one March 31st at Dyer's Cove, and I'll show you a couple of photos of that in a little bit. We have a sediment transport tool that's stocked and developed through our funding, and that kind of tells us some of the kind of a bird's eye view of what we might want to look at when we're getting ready to restore a beach, how we're going to configure a reef, that kind of stuff. But like Steve said, definitely see that there's a relationship between both um, when you do that. And then, of course, we tag crabs, which I heard some of you might be coming down with us. We tag about 15,000. I'll, I'll be there. Walter's coming with us. Cool. Hi, Hello. Walter. <laughs> Are you able to share the the oh, yeah. that way? Ed, if he shares it through email, the slideshow. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah I can do that. That's my problem. Yeah. Um, so this just gives you, to go through it briefly, again, here's the 2.74 miles. Here's the location of our beaches. You'll see yellow and green. We have control beaches. We have restored beaches. So the whole process in Delaware Bay while we're doing this, we're trying to learn from it, too. So to adaptively manage as things are changing or maybe it's not necessarily working, even though even here you could model <coughs> everything to, to high heaven, and you can still have something different that changes, so you kind of have to be ready for that. But I just want to show you what happened. So within months after Hurricane Sandy, we restored five beaches, and uh, this is what they looked like beforehand on four of them, and then afterwards. And we've been monitoring those beaches post-construction. Stockton did some work with us as well uh, throughout the whole thing, I think pre and post-136 one, three, one, three, in the year after sand was placed. We started noticing that uh, we weren't keeping all the sand on it. That's when we got into the reef kind of uh, piece and then started monitoring that. You can see just what the changes that happened by adding the sand first. And we learned particle size, uh, what grains best for the horseshoe crab as well as to improve the resiliency of that beach. Um, depth of the sand. as well was with the uh, crab spawn too. That yeah. And this was right after, so we got emergency permits in the beginning, right after Sandy to go and we just did these beaches as quickly as possible to get them set up because the crabs were coming. And that is right after, within two weeks probably of restoration, that's how many crabs came to those beaches. Those are crabs in the lower right? Yeah, yeah. horseshoe crabs. Well, they look like rocks from back there. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. It's all horseshoe crabs. It's the little screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so here's Beach. You see a similar. <laughs> this is one of our bigger beaches, and we didn't, we haven't completed this beach yet. We broke it out in four sections, and I think we did two of those segments so far, and we're kind of monitoring that. And here's the last one we did. Yeah, Dyer Cove, and that's where I was there. you were there. I still got the sand on my shoes. Yeah, and you can see at the, before we added sand, um, it was already up where that. The homes are with residents. Well, I could see the rock that they in front of that blue house. How that was. Yeah. How nasty that. We didn't be. restore exactly right in front of all these houses. We did right. on the sides of them. Right. Like the same kind of move around. And that's one thing we did learn too in Delaware Bay. And I don't know if that's up here, but uh, we had a feeder or a source beaches too. So we could actually Cooks Kimball's where I'm going back to do more work. That's feeding the shoals and other things around it, and uh, it's actually really providing some good spawning habitat and along the creeks. Nick, that plays into the back pass I did here where we would have the, we would have the uh, pocket beach down by the groin and allow the sand to in there and pass it out. So here's kind of a, an evening picture of, of uh, Reed's Beach again, the reef. Like I said, we have five reefs. I apologize, it's a little dated. It's about two weeks old, this, this uh, presentation. Each one of the, I mean, all together now we have about 2,000 linear feet of reef habitat itself. Um, and it does deter sand movement. It's reducing the wave energy, like I told you already, at about 35% in moderate conditions at moderate tide. And it's creating really good habitat. So ecologically, this is fantastic stuff. And we monitored that since we built it, just to kind of see the succession of this reef and how it's developing. And I just want to, I just want to mention something about the, the wave energy, the 35%. Keep in mind that during the peak high tide, there's not going to be much wave reduction at that point. But also at that point, that's when waves are more surging up onto the shoreline and they're actually pushing sand up the beach. Where the wave attenuation really increases, and this is a, this is a combined rate, you see almost 70% wave attenuation when you're on the lower part of the tides, which is when you have the wave that's scouring at the lower end of the, the beach face and it's dragging the sand out. So although it's a 35% wave reduction overall through a tide cycle, it's, it's much greater when you're on the lower end of the tide when the erosion's really occurring. Can this be engineered, though, for much higher wave energy attenuation? Because what we see down in Bayside Beach is we don't really have erosion 99% of the time 
However, when we have uh, nor'easters, we can lose five feet of, of grass, which, you know, is a stable in one event, sometimes even 10. So I think we're, can, can the, um, the shell bags be designed <coughs> to address that problem, which is the higher level energy problem? Excuse me. So to address that question, um, I can say we can build it to whatever height you want to build it to. But now you're starting to look at emergent type breakwaters rather than Definitely. reefs. Yeah. So the whole structure becomes a different, a different beast. Um, could be a width too. Yeah, you yeah. Can, there's a combination other, of the two together. There's other things that can be done to help attenuate. But like I said before, unless we're going to put out structure out there that's pretty significant during Sandy or a storm of that nature, you're not going to do it with these kinds of structures. The good news about Sandy is it's up above where our everything's already is flooded. And everything <laughs> floods. Yeah. yeah, it's really when, just to throw out a number, when the average tide is up by maybe two and a half feet, mm -hmm. three feet of, above normal, that's when we get most of our erosion. And above that, the energy is above the grass level on right. our beach. And so then it's just a flooding issue. Right. So again, the, the whole wave dynamic thing is you, you tend to get more of a plunging wave when the water's shallower than you do when it's higher. The, the higher waves tend to be more surging. Um, but that's not necessarily true during a storm event. So the long and short of it is, is you can increase the height of these. We were looking not to try and if we were not looking at the designs that we did here to try and address all situations and all case scenarios with mm -hmm. it. This is good driving plan. Is yes. Sort of what you're saying. Right. Um, um, it, again, if you have to decide as a collective what it is that you want to try and protect against. The, bit, the bigger the storm you're trying to protect against, the more expensive it's going to get for you to do that. I think they've done a really good job in, in putting together a draft plan. Um, I think there are a couple of things, uh, there are a couple of other options that might be considered. And I guess the most important thing I think all of you have to recognize is there are a lot of ifs in this. There are a lot of things that we don't know that you probably need to know to make a really good decision. Um, and if you notice that treating you're going this in, the, the first thing I do is there's studies that are required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the first but thing is a great, is a good topographic bathymetric survey. That's you know, treating study. this as a single project is a good idea. And I like, um, I actually worked, I think, on the first weir jetty that was installed on the east coast of the United States on Merle's Inlet in 1979. Um, My hometown. I didn't know that. <laughs> we can talk later. Um, building a feature into this that kind of collects sediment, sand, whatever, is a great idea. Uh, it gives you some cheap replenishment. Right. But uh, I, I would, I wonder if moving it up the beach on this side a little bit. You know, the, the structures that you have out here, the, the, the gabions, et cetera, are reflecting a lot of wave energy. That's why I think you're seeing more local erosion. Mm -hmm. But it, So if you put something right here at the end of this, a weir-like structure, whether it be groin, riprap, shell bag, whatever, and then actually try to use the beach as a place to catch the sand, um, might merit some consideration. Sure. Um, a groin, you mean like up here? He's talking about a, a short, type of groin, a short, short, low profile type yeah. of feature. If I'm getting quicker, she's getting yeah. Um, Can you do that with the bags? You're talking about right yeah. up here, Sam? Yeah. Because right. you're going to wrap the That's road. The you're right, aren't you going to wrap the road? No, it's going to slow. If, if it's done the correct way, you could actually slow down the water so it drops the sand. Yeah, but, I mean, you can okay. you can create that's, low profile that's like groins and low profile structures. I agree, and that's why I said I, I I'm just I'm just tossing out ideas. I, um, I don't because you're going to have to get some other information to. Right. I don't think you're going to necessarily create any deposition down drift of that at this point because there's no source right. in the updrift beach. So. We need to put a beach on the uptrip. Oh yeah, no, no, I agree. You okay. have to put the okay. beach out there, but right. if you do that, you just you keep it on the beach sure. a little longer. Right. Uh, and again, a, a lot of what we designed was 
in response to what we can what we thought the beach club residents would want. You know, and I know a lot of times we can taper the beach back too. I mean, we don't necessarily go as wide on the on the southern beach. We can make it as a taper quicker. Uh, there's a lot of modifications that can be done to this design. This is, like Stan said, this is really a draft proposal. It's not meant to be put out there for this is your final yeah. document. Yeah, your uh, baseline data is really going to drive the final design. Right. Once, once you get that survey data, then you can start looking at different types of features that we can add to it, mm -hmm. different ways that we can we can taper the fill, we can add fill here, we can create feeder beaches, which, which uh, uh, Captain Al was referring to earlier, which we did on Delaware Bay, where you overfill one area with the expectation that that material is going to bleed into your beach with a low profile groin that prevents it from going beyond a certain place. Which is, I get the idea of what you were looking for. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, uh, I am trying to look at this as a single project. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, obviously there's an important landowner not here. Yeah. So it's an important consideration for all of you um, in, in terms of that outreach, and we can help a little bit, Britta can help a little bit, there are other folks that can help a little bit. I mean, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I haven't found help. Um, and, and I really think that's in everybody's best interest. Is it in everyone's best interest to do this as a whole beach project? I, absolutely. you got to treat, treat it as a system. It's one system. You do piecemeal, and then you're going to wind up with what you have right now, where mm -hmm. something's been done, it wasn't done completely, and now it's having an impact, which you're noticing on your down trip beach. So, exactly. yeah, that, that's the problem with doing a piecemeal. Now, you could do this in stages, where I would recommend if you have to do it for budgetary reasons, start with the breakwaters offshore, whether it's the bags, whether it's the, yeah. the um, you know, the, the stackable reefs or whatever it is you choose to put out there. Um, that way, you're attenuating the waste before you put the beach in place. I would not put the beach in place and then wait a while yeah. to put these because you're going to lose sand. I only have to wait a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I this is a, I'm definitely into needs, not wants, for this beach. But there are some wants that are strong in the community. People that want to get back in the water, and that's legitimate. That's yeah. why they buy their homes here. Beautiful spot. I mean, and that's you know, what I said. Water out here today. Yeah, it's gorgeous. You got to give a lovely park. So, that's why I said earlier on. You have that concept plan that shows it being all done with sockgrass right down to the water's edge, which will give you a nice marsh edge, edge restoration type project. But you don't need to do that necessarily everywhere. You could keep some of it sandy, so you could have a point of access for recreational use. Um, so it really becomes. A I just explain that from a design. Um, Britta would say, "Barn get that hey, right. up over here." Uh, from a design point of view, what we did not want to do, I say, "Barn get Bay," was tell the residents where they wanted that beach access. Like, right. is it in front of this person's house or that? You know. Right. So we just did a uniform design right. and figured the right. community was best to inform where those beach access points it's were. A, it's a great design. Because we didn't want to get neighbors fighting before that needed to, well, you know. Right, right. I'm not, they can do whatever they want. But Dr. Farrell had said to us to not impugn the integrity of the dunes. Mm -hmm. It had to be a minimum of 500 feet apart. Openings. So, like oh, for access, 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 yeah, access yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Right. You don't want to have a lot of people trumping all over the dune. So you want to, you want to have places of egress. Now, you can modify that somewhat mm -hmm. if you are not just going to have a, a walk over where you're walking across the dune itself. <coughs> you want to place like mats. Uh, yeah, mats down or even uh, build uh, an over, a walk over that could be removed in the winter time and placed out when you want it to be placed out. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of features are usually permeable. Um, it's usually not an issue and that can, that again can increase your access points if you're willing to, to pay for that. Um, it can also be moved if there's a storm. Right, right. in the event of a storm yeah. coming. So we're doing, we're doing a similar ladder. project like this on, in Shark River with the same uh, Issue. same issues, sure. And the town's for it. They want to have, the town has FEMA money, so it's a little bit different funding source because they have to meet this benefit cost analysis that they, they created. And we're doing a, a, a dunes, expanding the beach, and then wave attenuation with shell bags, most likely. And that, but it's a 2,000 meter foot stretch, and it's horseshoe crab spawning area as well. How do you handle the boat trap? We have jet skis that literally come flying through 10 feet offshore. How do you handle that? 
to um, for the reason. Off, yeah. Well, we rates. have to market by by permit. We have to market as, as a hazardous structure that's out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we usually put the diamond out there on our on our structures, or we do put the diamond out there. Um, and then we have to confer with NOAA, and NOAA will map it on their nautical charts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they may require you, depending on proximity to channels, they may require you to put a buoy out there. That's again going to be with any structure that's placed offshore, um, whether it's the, whether it's the shells or whether it's the castles or reef walls. But low cost, we, we deal with uh, the Home Depot fencing, piece of PVC, and then two brackets we painted with an orange reflective shape. That was it, you know, on each side, and that met the requirements to mark it off. That was fine for Delaware Bay. I don't, I don't know what your proximity to some of these egress points in and out of the lagoons, right. they may require the, the state something. feds do have a little process they have to yes. lay down. Yeah, you have to. Prove it. So yeah. And, just, and I'm only asking this, I really do believe that the buy-in from the community is so important and may be Absolutely. what tips this over into a positive result. Well, one, of the, one of the talking points that I had on that proposal was volunteers and local community is priceless. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get those people to come out and support it and get out there and you can get these things done. And that's what's happening in Shark River. So there's there's about 60 people that actually marched against the town and said, we want we don't want the bulkhead, we don't want the bulkhead. So the town has turned it all around now. And, and they're doing that? this living shoreline design, which is oh, great. How far back in Shark River are you doing? Well, yeah. uh, are you familiar with it? Yeah. So you know South Riverside Drive, where the marina starts? Yeah, really okay. All the all way back. Can, so okay. so really can, can we uh, Yeah, let me go through this real quick. This I really feel bad for my heart. My foot went to sleep, but I'm going to He's doing a great job. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly just to give you ideas of what it can look like. Um, so this is, again, Reed's Beach. Uh, we built this pretty quickly because the tides cooperated. We usually do it on the spring tide or when it's pulled out of the meat. But uh, it worked pretty well for us on that particular one. It takes a lot of shell. This is all hand-bagged. One thing that I'm proud about these reefs, they're all hand-built. So each reef takes about 2,500 bags, all hand-bagged. We have an inmate program. We have U.S. veterans that help us out. And I'll kind of show you all that the value of this partnerships. Is an nylon bag? It is, but I'm investigating new material now, um, and it's made of potato waste, and it will dissolve in about two years. So that's good. But you want to make sure that, uh, at least in Delaware Bay, I have the ability to have oysters start fusing together and create create what I want on the reef. I'm not sure about here yet because we're going to have to set them ourselves. You know. So the oysters basically replace the bag. They, they replace the bag, but on, on the nylon doesn't break down anymore. They just eventually cover it up. There's no impingement to worry about. We, we monitored that to see if oyster crabs get stuck in it or anything. Or are there oysters out here? There are. So when we did Good Luck Point, I can't tell you exactly where they're coming from, but we did Good Luck Point, we did get a natural set, uh, not a big one. And only then it was gone the that next only year. about the place these bags where there's oyster breeding, right? No, we have they these. seed the bags with... Yeah, I would seed them. Ahead of time. Oh, yeah. That's what I was talking about, maybe more a big land based kind of an aquaculture yeah. piece. That's so, so I wanted to say something about this because I haven't responded to an email that, that you had sent uh, two weeks ago, but I didn't want it to sound fresh. But here's really what's on in my Be heart fresh. and in my mind. And I, I'm an upfront person. It's called Oyster Creek for a reason. True. <laughs> and good, good, good I'm going to tell you, there's some people up in Bricktown who live on Seaweed Point, and they call me to complain about the seaweed. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Actually, a lot of these places are named because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes perfect sense. So, so just so you have an answer for the homeowners, yeah, 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 it, it, yeah. it is a place I'll where oysters that, naturally occur. <laughs> <in there. laughs> but yeah, I was afraid yeah, you'd get that yeah, email. Like, like, We've been monitoring that. Anyway, just real quick, this is our veteran program. There's piles of my shell I have down in Delaware Bay. I just ordered more. Um, and here's what Steve was showing you. It's Veterans Reef. This is Reed's Beach. Um, reef Beach, we name veterans. So every Veterans Day for our U.S. military veterans, we name each one of these reefs after a military branch. Or this the first one was all military, so vets. And I'm a vet too, so it kind of worked out. But you can see here in June 2015, that's when the reef was first built. They did some scanning of it for elevation. And you can see by April 2016, the elevation of the reef hasn't changed, but the elevation of the beach has. So you can see where the sand is actually accreting there. We're not having, we're not seeing a scour. I'm curious about, you know, the castles and things. They're a little harder. They don't really take the energy of a wave as well as, you know, all these different shells mixed together. You know, that kind of dissipates some of the energy, too. And I think it reduces scour and actually helps to create the castles. I can't really speak to them, but I think of hard structure, and I think of a scour possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the green and yellow above, above sea level there. Is that it, sand that's a, 
that's visible? Yeah, so yep. it's all elevation, right? So the black is basically below, and then the, the red is the highest colors, the greens are, the, are coming up as you're, as you're rising yeah. up. So these areas here and over here, you can see there's, there starts to be an accumulation of sand, and then it expands throughout in January, and then by April, almost the entire reef has accumulated sand on the inside. Cool. The outside reef is where the wave attenuation is occurring. We, this one's a little bit different here because we we're looking at aquacultural rack. racks that we put in here as well to look at what the impacts were there, where they were. So where the aquaculture racks went in, we didn't extend the, the second outer reef down this way. <coughs> so I think that's why you see a more rapid accumulation of sediment in this corner because you have the outer reef there that was helping out. Um, but even by the end of the project monitoring at this one first year, you can see that there was accumulation of the current even where there wasn't the outer reef. So, so we are getting sand back, sand. keeping sand on the beach yeah. and adding sand. So that's great. Um, so one of the questions was, this is this year, uh, was ice. So some of the, one of the federal agencies yeah. wasn't, was really saying there's a problem with ice. We don't know if we want to fund any kind of intertidal reefs just because it's a waste of money, you're going to lose them. Well, this is Delaware Bay uh, a few months ago. We had three feet of ice. And where Shane's standing, he's my uh, habitat restoration coordinator, he's standing over Veterans Reef, so those pictures you just saw. Mm -hmm. And after the ice left, and you know, I forget how many days it was there, we went back and looked at it. And it's working. Our segment stayed. We lost out of 23 seconds, we lost one that was in a little bit disrepair. What I thought was really interesting, too, is barnacles were even still on there. So my thought is because the shell and how we make it and, and what's in, you know, what we make the structure of, uh, it's kind of asymmetrical. So the ice actually doesn't really scrape on it. It kind of breaks up that, that power as it goes up with the tides and moves out a little bit. So for me to see barnacles on there and, and all our oysters still intact after three feet of ice shows that once it's established, it's pretty strong, pretty resilient reef. And like I said, research shows that that interstitial space is a really resilient thing for a foundation of an oyster reef. And again, in the uh, back of the, the back of the, um, we're almost there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to point this out real quick. Captain Al, in case you're on the left, is that low tide? In case people can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when we go down. I'm going to have to send you this presentation because I'm not seeing anything. You know? Yeah, well, that's why I want to show. In case you, you can't see what's going on in the back here, this is the same reef. This is April 2016. This is March 2018 after the ice had left. So you can see what, what Al was talking about. This one reef here it had a little bit of uh, uh, movement in the one section of it, but the other three all maintain their integrity from as they were built. So I just that's pretty good to show you stand the ice that we had on the reef to kind of compare it. This was this year where Shane's standing is where the reef is. And uh, then we went back and monitored it after the ice left and uh, it stayed pretty well intact. Uh, we lost one segment out of 23, but even like I was telling them, barnacles were still on here. We still had fused oysters across. So it may be the function that's an established reef more so. Um, and I can't tell you what happened to the castles, but my thought would be there would be some scraping there because it's a harder surface. Um, that's well, just my like thought. Like I said, we didn't actually lose the entire thing. It just it did have some degradation. Well, those, the they're structure. low relief. It's, 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 it's low relief, which is great, but it, so it's serving some purpose. And the fact is that, that that one segment that needed repairing, we can go out and drop some bags on it, and we, we fixed it you know, for the time being, and hopefully that will establish over time again with, with oysters and the rest of that reef community. And there's ecological benefits, uh, science, I have to tell you about that because I like it. But definitely for fish, uh, we, get, we do fish surveys out there, we've got dogfish, um, I usually use traps just to see what's using where on the reef, unbaited, so not a lot of different, we got a weak fish one, some silver perch, so they're there foraging. Tons of, tons of blue crab came in right away, and then all the mud crabs of course, and, and worms, and then we saw over time how one species kind of would leave, and another would really start taking over as it's got established. And the birds, uh, a lot of oyster catchers hop on and feed on each one of these segments as well. We've seen that. And that really does show you how, how fast the oysters have, have attached to it. Yeah, and this was the first season. So that happened pretty quickly. Now the, the reefs are much different. And the thought is, as these, these like ecosystem engineers are going to vertically grow, as your reef and the beach comes up, the oyster is going to maintain that for the sea level rise. That's kind of what we're hoping to see. I don't know how drastic it's going to be here. But it would be it'd be interesting to have some data if I were to say yes, this really works. And I just was going to talk about marsh, but I know you're getting tired. So. Oh, good. 
we do a lot of monitoring so throughout all this to make sure it's working and a lot of this is through volunteers uh, like I said we tag crabs we have one of the biggest uh, that I know in Delaware Bay run by a nonprofit for horseshoe crabs yeah we, we do egg density surveys we do sand depth all kinds of stuff to see how our beaches are working and what we may need to do to go back in there to make it more beneficial if need be is, for the species that use them is there like we used to have this beach used to be covered with horseshoe crabs all gone even before they put the gate I mean when it was just rock they threw here is there any way like do you see them coming back to well, well we've had a couple down by us We'll we have we've, seen, we've seen dead ones at the Gabbia. Interesting we've point. Dead, we've seen empty shells on the yeah. stone. Do, do, do you remember the... In the breeding right. cupboard. Well, they will only breed on, on sandy beaches. They don't They yeah. don't do well on marsh right. substrate and that sort of thing. And I mean, I see a difference. So I tag in Shark River as well. And it's probably similar. Like I said, it's kind of similar here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I tag 250 in a season, but we'll tag 5,000 down in Delaware Bay. And that's all restored beaches. So I'm curious to see when South Riverside, when we restore that, how many crabs come in. Because they're looking for it. We have to kind of chase them down because they're moving around trying to find a little piece of something somewhere that's deep enough. Um, yeah, they move around. There are a couple of online things. I mean, the two crabs yeah. tagged in Delaware yeah. Bay actually do uh, oh, escape okay. a little bit. So, but this isn't Delaware Bay. They have them so, down in the. Uh, but they get around. They get around. Yeah. around. So, I mean, we've, the home we've gotten tag backs <laughs> in Barnaby <laughs> Bay. We've got tag backs, I'm going to say, almost all the way up to Maine, mostly Long Island area. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we did, we had tag backs all the way in Florida, but I don't really trust them as much. I think that might have been a tag that fell off and just drifted down somewhere. Yeah, they we, have get one them. we get them. We get up and there. down the coast. I was down in Assateague. We were down there with the kids, and they have a nature society, nature center there. They had one there that they had gotten with the crap and the tag. So. I think it's those reclaim the guy, uh, the bay guys. They have houses down. Drag it out there. And throw it around. <laughs> so I just wanted to. I was impressed. I just wanted to stress a little bit on the community involvement. Like today, having people involved, a diverse group, really kind of helps the project move along. It helps with your monitoring. It helps you learn more from it. I mean. Basically, the projects that I do now, I, we set up a citizen science program. We didn't really call it that back in the day. But people who are like the watchdogs that say, hey, I saw something happen out here, and they're calling us up, and we come out and look at it, because we can't be there every day, and we don't always have the funding to do that. And then we do fun things. So we do a celebration. When I first said that, people that thought fun. I was drunk or something. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's a celebration, not like, you know. And all are welcome, because we highlight the Welk, which is New Jersey State Shell. And, um, that's how we build reefs, and we have barbecue. So people come if you have barbecue and, yeah, and, and beer. Stuff. It's good stuff. <laughs> we wish we could have beer, but you can see, you can see, like the one celebration we had, 150 people show up, and then the next year there was a full-on blizzard going on out there, and we had 12 people show up, but we still had barbecue, and we just lived under tarps basically, and we tried to get warm. We built maybe two or three six seconds at too. Right, right. So it's it's good. It's good. And there's Dyer Cove, where uh, some of you were at already. And you can see we're, we're doing now drone monitoring of it. And this was built in just a, few, a couple short hours, if I remember, yeah. by about 100 and some people, 140 yeah. people. Yeah. And now, the kids. Yeah. Cool. And we'll monitor this by drone quarterly or seasonally, we're figuring, and with geolocating, so we can actually kind of see how much sand is coming back, staying on the beach or leaving. And I think you can tie it in with elevation, yep. too. So there's a lot we can learn from for a $400 drone flight. How long is that segment? 200 feet. This is 200, 200 feet. feet yeah. and that's exactly how we do the herringbone, and uh, that mm -hmm. allows the critters in and out, basically. We monitor that, like I said. And then it attenuates the waves, very low relief. I think this one's maybe two foot high at max. Thompson's yeah. was where we went almost three feet. That was Actually, we went four on the back, on the back side, two on the front right. side. Yeah. Again, we were able to do that because of where we were and how the, where the symmetry was. And we also do Veterans Day on the Bay, like I said, I'm a vet. Now we tie in the community again to the project. Uh, you can come out and inscribe on a shell a veteran that's close to you, that may have passed or is still around. And then we take those shells, and uh, kind of like old soldiers don't die, they just fade away. The ink fades away, but the symbolism is still there that these are hmm. veterans' reefs. Nice. And that's it. You did it. Yeah. Good job, Mary. And you can see if you, if you want to go look at more, restore NJ Bay Shore. It has all our projects out there. We blog about it. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of a kind of a demonstration of what it looks like. I know you guys have been out there and got Michelle from me, too. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I got for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.